Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm back with the one more topic as a continuation of yesterday's uh, classes. Uh, I had already mentioned yesterday there are some topics regarding femur which are important from an exam point of view. Yesterday we had discussed a shaft of femur fracture. Today we'll be discussing another topic that is a neck of femur fracture. This is again a very important topic both from a theory as well as a clinical point of view. But uh, here it's very common. Uh, it's a very common uh, fracture that is usually encountered in old age groups. So in normal everyday uh, Clinical practice, it's a very important fracture and it's very common uh, among the geriatric fractures, it's quite common. So we'll just discuss that in, uh, in brief. So this is again, I think most likely they will ask you as a uh, long question, same as before, like uh, in, in short about uh, clinical features, diagnosis, management, etc, etc. So uh, before we start, I'd just like to make a clarification regarding the class I had taken yesterday. I had mentioned the uh, Gestilo and Anderson classification, I think, yesterday regarding open fractures or compound fractures. There, while classifying it, I had mentioned it twice, and I think if I remember correctly, the first time I had mentioned how they classify it, like type 1, 2, and 3, based on the size of the wound. There I had mentioned as centimeters, and I think the second time when I mentioned it, I think by a slip of the tongue, I had mentioned millimeters. I, I just played it back and I noticed that yesterday. So that is actually wrong, it was just, I just mentioned it by a slip of the tongue while going very fast. So it is actually centimeters, like I had mentioned it first. That is a Gestilo and Anderson classification. So I just like to make that clarification. So we'll just get into today's topic. Uh, femoral neck fracture. Like I mentioned, some fractures are important. Like for example, neck of femur, head of femur. Then there is intertrochanteric fractures. Then fracture shaft of femur. Then there is a, a supracondylar fractures. When we come to the lower portion, then there is subtrochanteric fractures below the trochanter uh, uh, on the upper side of the femur. So these fractures are all important from a clinical point of view. So this is what we are discussing today is femoral neck fracture. So how do you define a neck of femur fracture? It is nothing but a fracture through the intra-articular part of the femoral neck. There is intra-articular, that, that part uh, which we consider for the fracture is actually part of the joint, the part of the hip joint. So that is intra-articular within the capsule to be precise. It's usually referred to by the term femoral neck fracture. So another term is intracapsular fracture. Here it's important because Usually, neck of femur fractures are intracapsular because it comes within the capsule. Whereas, when we discuss another important fracture, that is the intertrochanteric fracture, or simply called the trochanteric fracture, that is usually uh, extracapsular. That is important from a clinical point of view, as we will see uh, just a little bit later. So, that is one point you have to remember. So, another term is intracapsular proximal femoral fracture. About 80% of these fractures are usually displaced. Uh, majority of them are usually found to be displaced. That is, it goes out of its anatomical alignment or anatomical position. Uh, briefly, we'll discuss the anatomical fractures uh, regarding the neck of femur fracture. The structure of the head of the neck of femur is developed for the transmission of body weight efficiently with a minimum bone mass by appropriate distribution of the bony trabecular in the neck. Again, uh, you might have read in your anatomy classes in first year about the various types of trabeculae uh, in the bone, like uh, compression trabeculae, tension trabeculae, and all those things. Again, I'm going to detail there. So basically, it is very important from a point of view of bearing weight. That is the point to be noted here. So it has to be very strong because the entire body weight, like we discussed yesterday, the femur, as it is, it's a very big bone, thick bone, uh, because it bears a lot of body weight. So even as part of the femur, the neck itself has to be very strong because it has to bear a lot of weight. So the development is appropriately uh, taking place so as to be able to bear all that weight. So the tension trabeculae and compression trabeculae along with the strong calcar femoral, that is an important point if you remember the anatomy. It is an important point also from a surgical point of view for all these fractures like neck of femur, endotrochanteric and all those things. So the calcar femoral, that is actually a thickening uh, on, the con on the inside of the concavity, I think if you remember your anatomy class. So that's another important uh, point you can remember on the medial cortex of the neck of the femur. It forms an efficient system to withstand the load bearing and torsion under normal stresses of locomotion and weight bearing. So that is an important anatomical landmark. Uh, to be precise, uh, especially when it comes to surgical anatomy. In old age, osteoporosis of the region occurs and the incidence of fracture neck of femur is higher in old age. This is one of the most common fractures we encounter in old age, in normal everyday practice, along with trochanteric fracture. These two are very common in old age groups and especially common in females, obviously because of osteoporosis after menopause and all those things. So that is why it becomes very important even in uh, normal everyday clinical practice. Uh, very briefly about anatomy of the neck of the femur. 
The neck connects the head with the shaft as we know very well. It is the connecting point between the head proximally and the shaft distally. It is around 3.7 centimeters long approximately. It makes an angle with the shaft that is known as a neck shaft angle. Again, this is a very important uh, landmark uh, with respect to surgical anatomy. So uh, again, that we have to discuss that. So uh, it, it makes an angle with the shaft. Uh, so that is known as a neck shaft angle. Usually it's around 130 degrees, take or give around 7 degrees. Again, it is less in females due to the wider pelvis. For example, the carrying angle is bigger in females as you know very well. But here it is lesser in females due to the wider pelvis. So similar to that. It facilitates movement of the hip joint. It is strengthened by the calcar femoral, which I already mentioned. Uh, it, uh, so nothing but a bony thickening along the concavity. So that you can see a very simple diagram uh, representing the anatomy of the head and neck and the trochanders. So that is very briefly about that. It has basically two borders and two surfaces is mostly surgical anatomy. Upper border is concave and horizontal and meets the shaft at the greater trochander. Lower border is straight and oblique and meets the shaft at the lesser trochander. Anterior surface is flat and it meets the shaft at the IT line, that is the intertrochantric line. And is usually en entirely intra intracapsular. That's why uh, that's why I already mentioned it's kind of important because uh, in the clinical presentation you can differentiate between a neck of femur fracture and an IT fracture uh, because of this particular point, which I'll just mention later. So one thing to remember is it's usually entirely intracapsular. It takes uh, it, uh, it it is located within the capsule of the hip joint. And a posterior surface is convex from above downwards and concave from side to side, and it meets the shaft at the IT crust or intertrochantric crust. It is crossed by the horizontal group for tendon of obturator externus. As we know very well, a lot of insertions and you know muscle insertions and all those things which you mentioned uh, yesterday itself. So again, uh, we are not going into detail about the anatomy there, but this is very briefly about the surfaces and borders of the neck of femur. Uh, blood supply. This is very important. Uh, this can be asked as a separate short note also, in my opinion. So. Again, it's very important because of some complications which are very unique and which take place uh, very commonly as far as uh, neck of femur fracture is concerned. So Croc described, he's the person who described the, uh, the uh, blood supply, described the arteries of the proximal end of the femur in three groups. So basically you have to remember there are three important groups as far as blood supply of the uh, neck of femur is concerned. One is the extracapsular arterial ring located at the base of the femoral neck. Second is the ascending cervical branches of the extracapsular arterial ring on the surface of the femoral neck, also known as retinacular arteries. And third is what is known as the arteries of the ligamentum teres. So again, if you remember from your anatomy, these three things. So kind of blood supply of the neck of femur is important topic as such. It might be asked as a short note or it can be asked as a part of the neck of femur itself. So these three are the groups which are mainly responsible for supply of the proximal part, specifically the neck of femur. So we we'll just see very briefly about each of these. The extracapsular arterial ring is formed posteriorly by a large branch of the medial femoral circumflex artery and anteriorly by the branches of the lateral femoral circumflex artery. So again, if you remember your uh, vascular anatomy, you remember that uh, like the femoral, uh, the medial femoral circumflex artery and the lateral femoral circumflex artery. So these two together, uh, it is formed by branches of these two arteries. To form what is known as the extracapsular arterial ring. A very small contribution is also made by the inferior and superior gluteal arteries also, but it is mostly formed by the other two uh, major branches. Second is the ascending cervical arteries. They are nothing but uh, four groups of arteries. They are divided into anterior, medial, posterior and lateral based on their relationship to the femoral neck. That is the ascending cervical arteries and the lateral group is the one that is responsible for providing most of the blood supply to the femoral head as well as the neck. That is the second group, that is the ascending cervical arteries. So that is, uh, that is the first group, the extracapsular arterial ring and the second group that is the ascending cervical arteries. And the third is of course the artery of the ligamentum teres. So this you can see a brief diagrammatic representation of the blood supply of the uh, neck of femur. So if you can just remember this diagram, of course there will be different versions of this diagram in different textbooks, whatever is easy for you, you can just remember that. Uh, but uh, if you can always give a diagrammatic representation of the blood supply of the neck of femur, it will be a very good uh, point. So the artery of the ligamentum teres is a branch of the obturator or the medial femoral circumflex artery. And only a small amount is actually provided by it, but still it is very important because it forms uh, the third part of the group of uh, arteries providing the blood supply to the neck of femur. So if you can just remember that uh, diagram as far as blood supply of 
the neck of femur is concerned. Here the blood supply of neck of femur is very uh, important because a very common complication of neck of femur fracture is non-union. It is very notorious for non-union. That is, if you don't treat it properly, if you don't operate or whatever it is, it will never unite. It will uh, stay like that. There is no uh, question of it uh, uniting by itself. That is what is known as non-union. So some fractures are very notorious for non-union. Like for example, one is this fracture neck of femur and one is fracture of scaphoid in the hand. So uh, it's also uh, they are also very uh, uh, notorious for AVN. Uh, AVN is nothing but avascular necrosis. So these things are very notorious or uh, these fractures are very notorious for these complications. That is why the blood supply of neck of femur becomes very important in that sense. So just make sure you uh, know a little bit in detail about the, uh, the neck, uh, blood supply of the neck of femur, the unique blood supply of the neck of femur. So again, I will continue from there. Uh, uh, very briefly about pathoanatomy. Most fractures are displaced as far as the neck of femur fracture is concerned. Most of the fractures are usually displaced with the distal fragment. It will always be externally rotated, adducted and proximally migrated. That is why in the, that is important from a point of view of clinical presentation. So most of the times you see that it is externally rotated, adducted and proximally migrated. This displacement is less marked in intertrochantic fracture because the capsule of the hip joint. That's why I mentioned clinically you can differentiate when the patient comes to you in the OPD you can differentiate between a neck of femur fracture and IT fracture because both of them are very common in old age groups and before taking an x-ray you will not be able to diagnose what exactly it is whether it is neck of femur or IT fracture but looking at the patient looking at the attitude of the limb you can kind of make out whether it is need not always be accurate but you can still make out whether it is actually neck of femur or IT fracture and the point uh, the, the reason why it becomes important is because of that one is intracapsular one is extracapsular so uh, the lower limb if you look at it it will be completely externally rotated in case of an IT fracture uh, in fact you can just imagine the lower limb being externally rotated while the patient is lying on the stretcher or on the table so the lateral border of the foot will be touching the surface if the you can just imagine the lower limb is completely externally rotated so what will happen the lateral border of the foot will actually be touching the surface so that's what will happen in case of IT fracture because that fracture itself is in uh, extracapsular. So it will be completely externally rotated. Whereas in case of neck of femur fracture, because the fracture itself is intracapsular, it will be externally rotated but only partially. It will not completely touch the lateral border of the foot, will not completely touch the surface. So that is a very interesting and simple way of differentiating whether it is actually an IT fracture or a neck of femur fracture. But of course you need to, uh, what do you call, diagnose it conclusively with the help of an X-ray. So that is why it becomes important there. Uh, usually uh, we will come briefly about, uh, we will just discuss briefly about classifications as far as neck of femur fracture is concerned. One simple type of classification is anatomical classification that is nothing but subcapital, transcervical and basicervical depending upon the position of the fracture. As you can see here, a subcapital as you can see it is immediately below the head of the femur. So obviously it is subcapital, subcapital means below the head of the femur. Second one is transcervical. Transcervical means as the name suggests it is through the middle of the neck. So it is known as transcervical neck fracture. Third one what they have shown there is an intertrochantric fracture because, because you can see here the fracture line is uh, running between the greater and the lesser trochanters. But if it is just above that, that is if the, just imagine the fracture line being just above that but it is not through the middle. So what do you call that? Then there, there you can call it basicervical. So it is towards the base of the neck but not completely intertrochantric. So that is basicervical. But here the diagram what they have shown is an intertrochantric fracture which is a different topic we will discuss some other time. So but the three uh, lower diagrams you can see are the three other types of fractures which you can uh, usually observe uh, other than the shaft of femur which we discussed yesterday these are the other important fractures of the femur. One is a subtrochantric. So as you can see here it is below the trochanders both the trochanders so it is known as subtrochantric. Then of course isolated fracture of the greater trochanter and isolated fracture of the lesser trochanter. So you can just imagine it's all based on the anatomical landmarks of the femur. The namings are also based on the anatomical landmarks of the femur. So you can easily make out these different types of fractures. So anyway neck of femur is basically divided into three types that is subcapital, transcervical and inter, I mean sorry uh, basis cervical right. So I hope you understood that. Uh, Another important classification and named classification is what is known as Powell's classification. There are two named fracture classifications as far as neck of femur is concerned. One is Powell's and one is Garden's classification. We will just come to that. Powell's is nothing but a very simple uh, classification based on the angle the fracture makes with the horizontal line. Uh, this is the diagram with that. So if you draw the horizontal line touching the uh, that uh, upper part of the head as you can see here. Uh, what, the ang uh, the, what exactly is the angle made by the fracture in relation to that? Uh, horizontal line. Based on that, Powell has classified the fracture into three types. Type 1, 
type 2 and type 3. Type 1 is 30 degrees, type 2 is 50 degrees and type 3 is 70 degrees. So uh, the importance is because as a fracture progresses from type 1 to 3, the obliquity of the fracture line increases. Thus the shear force at the fracture site increases. So again, it all becomes important as far as the uh, management is concerned. So that is why you need to classify based on the angle the fracture line is making with the horizontal line. So that is known as Powell's classification. And a third important type of classification is what is known as garden's type. So these two are important, Powell's and uh, garden's type of classification. So garden's classification is again classified into four types. It depends on the completeness or what you can, you can say the uh, uh, how complete the fracture is, right? Uh, so it is divided into four types or the degree of valgus displacement you can say. So basically uh, it depends on the type of displacement. So type 1, type 2, type 3 and type 4. Type 1 is incomplete or it's valgus impacted. Uh, type 2 is complete and non-displaced on AP and lateral views. Type 2 is complete and non-displaced. It is complete, fracture line is complete, but it is still in the anatomical position, so it is non-displaced. Whereas type 3 is complete with partial displacement. So type 2, 3 and 4 are all complete, uh, but it depends on the type of displacement. So type 3 is complete with partial displacement and the trabecular pattern of the femoral head does not line up with that of the acetabula. Again, that of course, you can just remember like that. And type 4 is completely displaced. It is, the fracture line is complete as well as it is completely displaced also. So obviously that is the most severe type of uh, fracture. So again, just remember like that. So it, it is always based on the completeness of the, uh, so to speak, completeness of the, what do you call that, uh, fracture line as well as the degree of displacement, right? So type 1, type 2, type 3 and type 4. So these two uh, classifications are important. Anatomical is of course very simple based on the location of the fracture line. But uh, two named classifications are also important, Powell's classification and Garden's classification as far as neck of femur is concerned. Uh, we'll just move on from that, this is a simple diagram showing that a stage 1 is incomplete fracture of the neck, so called adducted or impacted. Uh, so you can see that stage 2 is complete without displacement, so type 1, type 2. Uh, so type 1 is, as you can see, incomplete fracture of the neck, type 2 is complete but without displacement, which we discussed earlier. Type 3 is complete with partial displacement, stage 3 or type 3. And uh, type 4 is complete as well as displaced. Fracture line is complete as well as it is displaced. So you can just have a look at that again if you want to. So that is the four types as far as garden's classification is concerned. Type 1, type 2, type 3 and type 4. So, yeah. There is one more classification. This is more mostly, uh, mostly uh, required for you know surgical purposes and all those things. That is the orthopedic trauma association that is OTA classification. That is, it is classified into three groups. Each one is further subdivided. Uh, you can just remember for uh, inter uh, academic interest. That is B1 is group for B1 group. That is known as B1 group, B2 group and B3 group. B1 group, a fracture is non-displaced to minimally displaced and it is subcapital. Uh, B2 it usually involves a transcervical fracture through the middle or the base of the neck, which we already seen earlier. And B3 group includes all displaced and non-impacted subcapital fractures. So, this is again, uh, so three, four classifications are there, but uh, you can just uh, remember it like that. So B1 group, B2 group and B3 group, that is OTA classification. Again, uh, it's a diagrammatic representation. It's a little bit confusing because each one is divided further into three types. You can just have a look and you can, uh, for academic purpose, you can just remember like that. B1 group, B2 group and uh, B3 group. This is more important or much more important uh, with relation to the surgical management or uh, operative purposes. So, these are the three or four important classifications as far as neck of femur is concerned. Mechanism of injury, I already mentioned, it is usually common in old age groups. Uh, that is why a lower energy trauma is enough. Unlike in younger patients, which we saw yesterday, that is shaft of femur fracture, which is usually sustained due to high energy trauma. But here, it is usually sustained as a result of low energy trauma, like a simple fall because of uh, old age and you know, osteoporosis and all those things. For example, a fall onto the greater trochanter, direct fall onto the greater trochanter or forced external rotation of the lower extremity, impinges an oste osteoporotic neck onto the posterior lip of the acetabulum, resulting in posterior comminution, or indirect muscle forces overwhelm the strength of the femoral neck. So basically, what you need to remember is they are always sustained as a result of low energy trauma. That is a simple trivial fall can result in uh, fracture neck of femur and IT fracture also. Uh, especially in old age groups and more common in females compared to males. So there is a mechanism of injury. High energy trauma, if at all you do get femoral neck of, uh, neck of femur fracture in younger patients, again it is due to uh, high energy trauma just like shaft of femur. Both young and older patients have motor vehicle accidents or fall from significant height. 
Then there's another type of uh, mechanism of injury that is cyclical loading or stress fractures. These are again just like a shaft of femur fracture, they are commonly seen in uh, particular occupations like athletes, military recruits, uh, ballet dancers, ballet dancers, patients with osteoporosis and osteopenia are at particular risk. So those are uh, such type of uh, fractures, ballet dancers and patients with osteoporosis and osteopenia. So all those uh, athletes and all those things. So basically that is more common in uh, uh, patients with uh, uh, specific occupational uh, risks. So these are the different mechanisms of injury uh, as far as uh, fracture, neck of femur is concerned. Diagnosis obviously uh, it's always made with the help of an x-ray, right? Uh, we'll come to that. Uh, uh, so in stress fractures, elderly patients with unexplained pain in the hip should be considered. So if at all the patient is old and the patient is complaining of a severe pain in the hip joint, you always need to suspect a fracture like this. Uh, impacted fracture may be difficult to visualize on plain x-ray. Impacted basically means the fracture fragments are, you know, bunched together. That's the meaning of impacted. Uh, that is again become uh, it becomes important as far as a clinical presentation is concerned because even though you would expect a fracture neck of femur the patient will be obviously bedridden the patient will not be able to walk but here a unique thing about impacted fracture is the patient will come walking which you would not expect in a fracture uh, in a neck of femur case uh, so because here that is what is known as an impacted fracture they are bunched together because of the forces acting on the fragments they are bunched together and you know the patient can almost act like there is no fracture even though pain will be there, the patient will still be able to bear weight and walk. That is why an impacted fracture becomes important. Sometimes what happens is there might be a painless fracture also. For example, in a bedridden patient, may develop a silent fracture. Especially if the patient is diabetic, highly diabetic with neuropathy and all those things, you can even have a painless fracture. Uh, multiple fractures need to be suspected in patients with femoral shaft fracture. Like I mentioned yesterday, you need to rule out a certain fractures along with shaft of femur fracture. Like for example, neck of femur fracture or uh, fractures around the knee joint and all those things need to be ruled out, especially in polytrauma patients. Right. Uh, radiography, as we know very well, is a preferred initial imaging modality in evaluating femoral neck fractures, right? Uh, X-rays. Usually we go with the pelvis uh, with both hips or you can take separately that particular hip joint. You can take an AP and lateral view, which is not usually preferred. We always go for a AP view, that is anthroposterior view of the whole pelvis, that is pelvis with both hips. Right? So that is a usual preferred view, x-ray view. Uh, sometimes you also need to do CT scan. Like for example, uh, to uh, suspect certain fractures or to uh, diagnose certain fractures. Like for example, spiral fractures, comminution. If the fracture is comminuted, in that case you need to go for further investigations like a CT scan. Right? Okay. So uh, majority of the cases usually an x-ray is enough. But uh, in such cases, especially if there is, uh, if at all you are suspecting some kind of neurovascular compromise or, you know, if there is comminution of the fracture or uh, stress fractures, those fractures you need to diagnose along with, uh, you need to take further help of imaging studies like, for example, CT scan and all those things. Uh, yeah, so that's briefly about CT scan. It's not much, uh, you don't need to go into detail there. So, uh, mm, yeah. So, you can also go for MRI. Just like CT scan, you can also go for MRI. Right. Uh, again, uh, it all just remember like this, if at all, there are further complications. If it's a simple fracture, it can always be diagnosed with the help of x-ray alone. But if at all, you are suspecting further uh, complications, like you are suspecting a fracture, but the patient is coming walking to you. Like in that case, it might be an impacted fracture. Or you are suspecting severe trauma or, you know, multiple comminution of the fractures. Or if at all, you are suspecting some kind of neurovascular compromise. You know, all those particular situations or special situations, you need to go for further investigations like CT scan, MRI, and sometimes even what is known as a uh, nuclear med uh, nuclear medicine. Uh, basically, they use radioisotopes, uh, radioactive isotopes to diagnose the fracture. Uh, this is not uh, available in all centers. There are only specific centers which do uh, nuclear imaging and all those things. But if at all it is available, you can take the help. So here, some uh, particular radioisotopes are used. Like for example, technetium-99, uh, maybe I think gallium-67, I think. So such care, such things can be used or such radioisotope imaging can also be used. So just remember the diagnostic procedures along with x-ray, CT scan, MRI, uh, radioisotope uh, that is a uh, nuclear medicine and all those things can be used as various diagnostic procedures. Uh, just remember before we go into treatment, I think I missed one slide. As far as the clinical presentation is concerned, majority of the cases the patient will present to you lying down. Uh, he or she will not be able to walk around obviously. Uh, 
but uh, then I already mentioned how you differentiate between IT fracture and a neck of femur fracture, looking at the attitude of the limb, whether it's actually lateral border is stretching the surface or whatever it is. So majority of the cases, obviously the patient will present like that with severe pain and swelling in the hip joint. So you automatically think of uh, one of these fractures like neck of femur or IT fracture or something like that. But in very few cases, which I already mentioned, the patient may actually come to you walking, but give you a history of trauma or falling and severe pain. So in that case, if the patient is especially susceptible, like for example, old age uh, females, or uh, if you look at the bone, it's highly osteoporotic. You know, if you look at an x-ray, all those things, if you suspect, you need to suspect an impacted neck of femur fracture. So those are the unique situations. So all these things will uh, provide some kind of uh, clinical picture or how you diagnose a patient clinically. Then of course, we come to treatment. Treatment, conservative treatment or non-surgical treatment has very limited role in case of neck of femur fracture because I already mentioned one of the most notorious complications as far as neck of femur is concerned is non-union. So if you do not treat it properly or if you don't treat it adequately, there is no question of that fracture uniting by itself. Whereas an IT fracture can be expected to unite. If you leave the patient like that, if you're not operating due to a variety of reasons, whatever it is, the fracture can unite. But here, there is not uh, much of a chance of the fracture uniting at all. So the patient will be permanently bedridden. And that is, of course, a big risk, especially in old age groups. If the patient becomes permanently bedridden, there will be a variety of other complications, which can actually result in the uh, morbidity or death of the patient. So you need to, as far as the, if the patient is fit, and if there is any way you can operate, you need to take the risk and fix the fracture. That is why it becomes important there. So that is why uh, fracture neck of femur has a very limited uh, scope for non-surgical treatment or uh, non-operative treatment. Right? So there are some uh, reasons why this fracture is notorious for non-union. Uh, that's why I mentioned the unique blood supply there. right? Because of the interference to the blood supply by the proximal fragment, that fragment, proximal fragment interferes with the blood supply. That is one reason. Uh, second one is what is known as a fracture hematoma. It's not completely formed as a result of the synovial fluid because it is bathed in synovial fluid, the entire capsule, the hip joint. So because of the excess of the synovial fluid, the fracture hematoma, which I think you already mentioned, uh, which you already learned in stages of healing of fracture. Hematoma is very important as far as a fracture healing is concerned. But here there is no proper uh, fracture hematoma formation because of the excess of the synovial fluid. Then of course the blood supply. Then there's something called the absence of the cambium layer. If you remember your anatomy. It doesn't have the cambium layer. So there are a variety of reasons why the neck of femur fracture is more prone to non-union. And because of all these reasons, you need to operate if the patient is fit. That is why it becomes very uh, dangerous to treat it conservatively. Surgical treatments obviously is a mainstay, right? Uh, then it depends on uh, what type of surgery you do or what kind of implant you put depends on the age group and the morbidity of the patient and a variety of other factors. Uh, it usually involves two things, perfect anatomical reduction and rigid internal fixation. Earlier, we used to use an implant known as a Smith-Peterson nail or SP nail. Uh, you might have seen it in the instrument class. It is still available in our OPD. Uh, that SP nail is not used nowadays anymore. Right Now, the gold standard what we use is what is known as austin Moore's processes or AMP. austin Moore's processes or a bipolar processes. Bipolar processes which is another type of uh, which is slight modification or again slightly different from Austin Moore's processes. Sometimes even a DHS, what is known as a dynamic hip screw. Uh, we'll just come to that. And finally, some indications may be there for a total hip replacement. That is THR, total hip replacement. So these are the modalities of treatment, surgical management, which we usually adopt nowadays to treat fracture neck of femur. Or sometimes it can even be fixed with simple screws, compression screws, what we call CC screws or whatever it is. Simple screws can be used. It all depends, like I said, uh, that of course we need to go into detail there. Uh, that is of course more of a, we don't need that uh, at this particular uh, point. But again, these are just, if you can remember the names, these are more than enough. That is, these are the common implants or common modalities of surgery that we use nowadays to treat fracture neck of femur. So usually in older patients, that is patient above 60 years of age, usually they are removed by, they are uh, treated by removing the head and putting an austin Moore's processes. Austin Moore's processes is a, an example of hemiarthroplasty. Arthroplasty means replacement of a joint. Hemiarthroplasty means only one surface of the joint is replaced. So Austin Moore's processes, bipolar processes, they are all examples of hemiarthroplasty. You are only replacing the head and neck of the femur. You are leaving the acetabulum as it is. You are not touching the acetabulum. Whereas in a total hip replacement, total means both the surfaces are replaced. So both the head, uh, the head of the femur as well as the acetabulum are replaced. So that is the difference between hemiarthroplasty and a total arthroplasty. So hemiarthroplasty, most important uh, 
tool or implant that we use here is AMP, Austin Moore's processes. Whereas in children, if at all in rare cases you do get a case of fracture neck of femur in children, there you can use what is known as a hip spiker, which you already seen yesterday. How a hip spiker can be used by placing the hips in abduction for 8 to 10 weeks. So hip spiker, like I mentioned earlier, it is used for a variety of purposes, for congenital deformities, for fracture treatment. So this is another use of hip spiker, especially in children. Right? So that is how you basically treat it. two extreme age groups. That is one is old age group and the other one is uh, very young children. Right? So that is one thing. Uh, this shows an example of a dynamic hip screw. Dynamic hip screw is usually considered the gold standard for treatment of intertrochanteric fracture or IT fracture, which we will discuss some other time. So basically, it can even be used in neck of femur fracture, as I am mentioning here. Because this is the typical implant, as you can, if you can look at that uh, x-ray, this is also available in the OPD in instrument class. This is known as a DHS, dynamic hip screw, which is fixed, which is nothing but a plate with a Richard screw, that screw which you see there, the big one which is going into the neck and the head, that is known as a Richard screw. Then you have a, basically a plate which is fixed onto the bone with the help of screws. So that will take care of the neck shaft angle, which we mentioned earlier. So you know, it is, more, it is modeled according to the normal neck shaft angle and all those things. So just remember the name of the implant, that should be more than enough. So this is known as a dynamic hip screw or DHS, DHS. Uh, this shows a picture of an Austin Moore's processes, which I already mentioned. Uh, this is an example of a hemiarthroplasty implant. And the second diagram you see there is of course a total hip replacement. There you can see there, if you can look at it, both the acetabulum as well as the head and neck have been replaced by uh, metal uh, processes. So that is why it becomes an example of a total arthroplasty or total hip joint replacement, right? So these two are again modalities of treatment. This is a very broad guidelines as far as treatment is concerned. So if it's more than 70 years and it's undisplaced, you go for a DHS. But if it is totally displaced, you go for a uh, AMP uh, processes, that is, or a THR. Whereas in young adults, that is the uh, middle, middle group, uh, younger adults, you can either take a DHS if it is undisplaced, or you can go for a DHS osteotomy, that is screws and all those things, or you can even do a processes. So a variety of options uh, is available there. Whereas in children, which I already mentioned, if it is undisplaced, you go for a hip spiker or you can even go for multiple mood spinning. That is, of course, using the various screws, right? Uh, so again, yeah, so it depends on that. So this is very broad guidelines. Of course, it all depends on the particular patient. It depends on the hospital setup. It depends on the surgeon's choice. A variety of factors will come into picture there. But these are the broad guidelines which you can uh, generally apply for treatment of various age groups. Uh, very briefly about complications that I already mentioned, one of the most important complications is non-union as far as neck of femur fracture is concerned. Another one is thromboembolism. Uh, this is more common in case of fracture shaft of femur, uh, which is a very uh, dangerous situation like we mentioned yesterday, like hypovolemic shock, uh, fat embolism, all those things are much more dangerous or much more common in case of uh, shaft of femur. But uh, there is a certain degree of risk even in neck of femur fractures also. Uh, like for example, leading cause of death within the first seven days, especially in older age groups and all, you need to be more careful. But uh, and the third one which I already mentioned is avascular necrosis. Avascular necrosis, as the name suggests, is nothing but avascular necrosis. So due to lack of blood supply, the head goes for necrosis. The head dies off uh, and becomes useless. That is known as avascular necrosis. So these are the more again uh, other complications are also there based on all different uh, general complications of fractures and all those things will be there. But here. As far as neck of femur is concerned, the most important are these uh, three or four. There is non-union, AVN, avascular necrosis, and thromboembolism. Non-union, uh, it's quite uh, common, which I already mentioned, it's around 85 to 95% of cases. Even after uh, proper internal fixation, it can still happen. So not only in a fresh fracture, even after internal fixation with the processes, it is still prone for development of non-union. So you cannot give a guarantee to the patient, okay, we have fixed the fracture, it will be perfectly all right. There is always a certain risk of non-union because of the specific anatomy and blood supply and all those things. Uh, so that is what you need to remember there. So how do you define non-union of a neck of femur fracture? They have just mentioned that. If there is no evidence of radiological healing taking place between 6 and 12 months after treatment, it is called a non-union. So you can wait up to 12 months, you can say, neck of femur fracture. So that's quite a long time, almost one year it becomes. So even then, you can wait till then and you see no signs of radiological union, you call it a non-union. But of course, in, usually it takes around six to nine months. In case of general features of fractures, we usually give a time period of six to nine months to declare it a case of non-union. But uh, again, it depends on various you know, factors. It's not a hard set, like you know, it is not written in, uh, you know, it's like pro not properly, uh, it doesn't say that it has to be this particular time period. It is kind of variable. So here you can wait up to six to 12 months.
causes we already say inaccurate reduction poor internal fixation vascularity of the femoral head uh, these are the reasons for non union so how do you suspect if the patient is going for non union obviously the patient will not be able to bear weight they will be wasting of muscles and there will be shortening of the lower limb so these are the clinical signs which will direct you uh, towards thinking that uh, it is a case of non union or the fracture is not uniting as expected right so that is those are the causes and clinical features as far as uh, non union is concerned vascular necrosis already mentioned it's nothing but the head of the femur is and uh, yeah so again the clinical features will be the same like pain in the hip will be there limping will be there and there will be limitation of all movements right so those are the uh, reasons why you need to suspect a vascular necrosis of avn right uh, treatment is usually by rest traction and weight relieving calipers sometimes osteot osteotomy needs to be done as far as uh, avn is concerned so that is just remember if at all they ask you for a short note or something you can mention because it's a very common complication of neck of femur fracture along with non union so or you might even need to go for an arthroplasty if at all it is not uh, resolving on its own so just remember like that so that concludes neck of femur fracture like i mentioned again it is a long topic uh, it is more important in case of a clinical examination but it won't be present as a clinical case or anything like that in uh, at a bbs level but uh, from a theory point of view this is very important so make sure you read up a little bit of a uh, little bit in detail about neck of femur fracture okay thank you very much thank you